Well, good morning, and can I wish you all a very happy new year. It's hard to believe we're into 2021, but it is good to join together to worship our God and thank him for his faithfulness. Can I welcome you to our online service of worship, and we do trust and pray that as we join together, we will all be inspired by God's word and encouraged to live out our faith for Christ going into 2021. There aren't too many announcements to bring to your attention other than to say that we wait on God uh, tomorrow evening at 8pm via Zoom. Uh, for the login details, please contact Richard. Then our collection for the homeless is taking place today until next Sunday, the 10th of January. Uh, the church halls will be open for donations during the week, like at harvest time. Uh, items such as men's socks, coats, scarves, boxers and gloves are greatly needed at this time of the year. Uh, so let me commend this appeal to you and ask for your generosity as we seek to reach out in Christ's love in this practical way. Then a note from our treasurer, David, just to remind you that our church accounts close next Sunday, the 10th of January. And then finally, as things stand, we do plan to meet next Sunday at 10 a.m. for those with surnames, between A to L, with parents of Sunday school children. And then the 11.30 a.m. service will be for those whose surnames are between M to Z. Of course, we will still continue to provide an online service at 11 a.m. If there are any changes during the week, we will indeed let you know. Today, we're going to start our new series in the book of Hebrews a wonderful book that points us very clearly to Christ and our need for him in every aspect of our lives as we run the Christian race to glory. And as a call to worship, I would like us to responsively read these words found in the penultimate chapter of Hebrews, familiar words that point us to Christ and call us to look to him as our vision. I'll read the yellow text if you could respond in the white text. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Before the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. And so as we fix our eyes on Jesus, let us sing our opening hymn that reminds us to seek Christ as our vision going forward in the words of Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart.
Well, let us come before our awesome God in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, what a wonderful hymn of praise to start the new year with. A hymn of praise and prayer, seeking you, Lord, to be our vision going forth into 2021. And Why do we seek you? Because you are our great Father, our wisdom and true word, our high King of heaven and our bright heaven Son. Lord, you are our true God of true God, our Lord of lords and King of kings. You rule with all might, power and authority. You exercise true justice and peace in all your world. Father God, nothing is beyond your control or understanding. For you have created everything and you sustain it all by your mighty right hand. Lord, you are the light of the world. And what a hope that brings us as we embark into the new year. May we seek your presence always. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. However, Father, when we contemplate your greatness and adore you with wonder, we are mindful that we are far from perfect. We sin time and time again. With Daniel, we declare we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. And so as we acknowledge our sin to you, our holy God, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to show us our sins as we confess them to you now in this short silence. O oh God of grace, Lord of mercy, spirit of love, forgive us, we pray. Rem remove our sins from us and help us to live for Christ forevermore. May thou and thou only be the first in our hearts. May we not heed riches nor man's empty praise. Rather, may we seek your glory and honor always in our lives. May thou be my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. For Father, we pray all these things in Christ's precious name and glory as we join together in the words that Christ taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, boys and girls, Richard is now going to speak to you now. Well, a happy new year to everyone. Have you had a good Christmas? What did you get? Did you get any presents? Well, do you like my new jumper? This morning I'm going to share a few photographs of my favourite granddaughter. I hope you don't mind me sharing these, but they're a bit special to me. So here's the first one. It's a picture of Pippa when she was just one day old. She's so small. And when she was born, she couldn't do anything for herself. She couldn't feed herself. She couldn't change her nappies. She couldn't do anything. Somebody else had to feed her, to look after her, to keep her comfy and warm. And of course, her mom and dad did that. She needed their support. But soon she was starting to do things, sitting up, eating solid food, crawling, exploring, then walking, and then starting to make sounds. And now, starting to form words. And that's the most recent photograph of her pushing her doll around in a buggy. And you can see a big change in her, and I can see a big change in her. We can see how she has grown, developed, how she can do new things. And of course, we're excited and delighted by every little thing that she does. We loved it when she was a little tiny baby, but we didn't want her to stay that way. Oh yes, we loved her like that, but we wanted her to grow and to develop, to be able to do the things that babies do, 
to learn to crawl, to learn to walk, to start making sounds and then words. And if she hadn't done all of those things, if she hadn't developed in the way that she has, we would have been concerned. We'd have wanted to take her to the doctor. But thank God she is well and she's doing all the things that we'd want her to. The Bible tells us that being a Christian that is a follower of Jesus is a little bit like being a baby. And that's how we start as a Christian. When we ask Jesus to be our special friend, when we ask Jesus to come into our lives, it's as if we've started a new life. It's a new start. It's as if we were a baby Christian. But God doesn't intend us to stay as a baby. He wants us to grow. And especially to grow to know him more, to love him more, and to be like him more, especially like Jesus. So how do we do that? Well, of course, we need food to grow, not milk and bananas and other food that a baby needs. But what makes us grow is spending time with God. The first thing that I suggest is that is praying to God. God loves to hear from you. He wants you to tell him all about your life. He wants us to listen to him as well so that we become more like him and the things that are important to him. The Lord's Prayer says, your will be done on earth with us here as it is in heaven. So praying is the first thing. The second thing is reading God's word, reading the Bible. And that way we can learn about Jesus. Now, we're starting a new series with your mums and dads and everybody else in the church in the book of Hebrews, in the Bible. It's a book that tells us a lot about Jesus, about who he is, about what he's done. We want to know more about Jesus, God's son, our special friend. And I would encourage you to read the Bible, or if you can't read for yourself, ask your mums and your dads to read for you so that you can come to know Jesus better. That's the second thing. The third thing that is a very difficult thing to do at the moment, and that is meeting with others. Because we're in restrictions because of COVID, it's difficult to get together the way we would like. It's difficult to get to Sunday school and church, difficult without girls' brigade or boys' brigade. And it's good to meet with other people, to learn about Jesus, to share about Jesus. And I hope when all the restrictions are lifted, we'll be able to get back together and be able to learn about Jesus together. But three things that I suggest, two things we can do for now at the beginning of this year. One is to take time to pray to God. The other is to read the Bible and learn about Jesus. And then one to we can do in the future, whenever we get back together, coming to church, to Sunday school, learning the stories of Jesus, who he is, what he's done, how much he loves us, and the way he wants us to be friends of his, to follow him and become more like him. You see, God doesn't want us to stay just as baby Christians. He wants you and I to grow, to become more like Jesus. The same way that I want to see Pippa growing and developing. May God bless each one of you as you grow and as you come to know Jesus better. We're going to sing a song now. It's entitled Every Blade of Grass.
we have been using the Presbyterian Church's digital dispatch DVDs over the past weeks, and those have helped to give us uh, a view of the wider mission work of the Presbyterian Church. And this week, we're going to be traveling to St. Petersburg in Russia to hear from Annas and Olga. Hi, I am Anis. Hello, and I am Olga. Здравствуйте. We are PCI Global Mission Workers in Russia. Here we are involved with the academic theological training of church leaders. Anis' main task is to develop new courses in practical theology and systematic theology on both bachelor and master levels. And Olga has the wonderful, difficult task of translating and interpreting for me and um, translating this material into Russian so that students could have something to read. The situation with COVID-19 has had a big impact on our lives and the life of the university. Yes, we have been teaching online since middle of March 2020. Churches have been closed and they also did their teaching online. It also had a a big effect on the financial stability of uh, the university and many of the personnel had to ta take about a 50% pay cut. We are so grateful for your support for the United Appeal that helps us to serve God's mission to the world in this place where God is so needed. Yes, here are some points uh, that you can pray for now with us as you seek to go deeper and wider into God's mission in this world. Please pray for Anas for his wisdom and discernment and inspiration when he develops very difficult programs. And please pray for Olga as she has to translate this into a language, a difficult language, but also a language where many of these theological terms do not exist. Please pray for our students and lecturers who serve the Lord all over Russia in contexts that are not always positive towards evangelical Christians. And please pray for the financial stability uh, of the university. It is a crucial institution uh, serving the evangelical Christian community in Russia. Remember that we continue to pray for you as a congregation of PCI, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And may God continue to empower you, strengthen you as you minister where God has planted you at this time to be his witnesses. We pray for God's blessings on your families and thank you again for your love, prayers and support. Until next time, das Vidania. Let's take a moment to pray for Annas and Olga. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for Annas and Olga in Russia. We ask for wisdom and discernment for Annas as he teaches and for Olga as she translates. We bring to you their students and indeed for all the students and lecturers all over Russia as they seek to live for you and make you known in that vast land. And we pray that Annas and Olga will be used by you to build up your church. That all this may be for your glory. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one of the things that have, has lifted my heart most during the restrictions, indeed through the lockdown of last spring, uh, at a time when we can't get together as we would like, is the singing of a beautiful song that brings us all together. It's a song that took a lot of time and effort and skill from Stephen and from others as it was put together uh, for us as a congregation. Uh, it's a song that I don't grow tired of hearing. Indeed, that first time that I heard it, I, I, was, uh, I shed a little tear. Uh, I just, it was so beautiful and meant so much to me. It's a song that's very appropriate for our service today at the beginning of this new year. Is he worthy?
We're starting a new series in the book of Hebrews. It's a book that was written to a church in, the time of, in a time of difficulty and with lots of external challenges to their faith. And for that reason, I think it's especially relevant to us for today. It's perhaps not one of the easiest books to grasp because it uses imagery and allusions which were familiar to those from a Jewish background, but which may seem a little bit alien to us. However, on the other hand, it includes some imagery that is, brings alive who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. So much so that some have called it the fifth gospel. I think you'll find it well worth exploring. Do take the opportunity to read the book uh, in its entirety to get a feel for it as, as a book, because that's how it was written, that's how it was meant to be heard in the first instance. May I also encourage you, if you can, to watch the Bible Project introduction to this book on YouTube. It's eight minutes, and I thought a little bit long to share in this service, but I am going to put it up on our Facebook page, so you may be able to access it there. Over the past Months, we've been indebted to those who put so much effort into putting these services together. Those who have worked behind the camera, and none more so than Jamie. Uh, but for once today, Jamie is going to come to the other side of the camera, and he's going to read to us from uh, the first three verses of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, verses that set the scene. God's final word, his son. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, 
he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. In entitling our series in Hebrews, Race to Glory, I'm picking up uh, a theme, uh, an analogy used by the author in chapter 12 when he invites his listeners to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. He likens the Christian life to a race with that commitment and discipline and goal that is necessary as we run. We could use all sorts of examples of people racing, whether that be the Olympics or a local half marathon. We could think of a point-to-point or a Grand National, the Northwest 200 or the Superbike World Championships. But I'm going to turn to Lewis Hamilton, Sports Personality of the Year, I understand to be knighted in the New Year's honours list. 2020 was a good year for him, becoming world champion for the seventh time. 2020 also marked his entry into a different form of motorsport, Extreme E. He has set up a team to compete in the inaugural Extreme E season with a, where electric vehicles will race in five remote locations, Arctic, desert, rainforest, glacier and coastal. Speed will obviously be a factor, but it will also be endurance as cars negotiate tough conditions. The cars are built for that purpose with tires and suspension to match. And it strikes me that it will be a marathon rather than a sprint. And in that sense, and in other senses, quite different from Formula One. And also in that sense, it's probably more like the Christian life. For life with Christ is about staying the distance rather than about the zeal with which we start out. That is very much the message which the writer of the book of Hebrews wants to convey to us. Indeed, the main purpose of this letter is to build up, to encourage, to strengthen, to sustain the people of God in their race of faith. Keep going. Keep your eye on the prize. Look to Jesus, who has done it all for you and who continues to intercede for you. The two primary recurring calls throughout this book are to hold fast and to draw near. Keep confessing the faith. Keep coming to God through Christ. Hebrews tells us to persevere. And we do that principally by looking to Jesus Christ who persevered before us and for us. We don't do this on our own. As verse 12, 2 puts it, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We're going to come back to that again and again through this series in Hebrews. But let's take a step back to the context in which this book was written. The emphasis on perseverance suggests that the Christian church to which it was written was struggling or facing difficulty and challenges. This is 30 days, 30 years, sorry, after the death of Christ. And the conditions are more akin to the tough ones of the Arctic, to that of Silverstone. It's reckoned that the book was written sometime in the mid-60s AD. In other words, before the destruction of Jerusalem and before the persecution of Nero. So Christians would not have endured the type of persecution that was to come, but they may well have endured ridicule, Perhaps exclusion from certain jobs, perhaps socially alienated from the wider community. And for those from a Jewish background, that would have been significant. The picture that emerges is that it was difficult enough for the young Christians of the church in that day. And some were slipping back. Some of them were even turning away from their new Christian faith. Many needed to be encouraged. Others needed to be challenged to keep going. And perhaps this is relevant for us today because we face uncertain times. Unable to enjoy fellowship together as we would want. Faith can be a challenge. It's easy to to drift, to lose our bearings. And this book has a message that's very relevant to us. 
It's the same message as it was to the original recipients. Hold fast to your faith. Draw near to Jesus, our Savior. Because what Jesus has done is absolutely key. And it's the same for us as it was for those Christians in the first century. And that is highlighted in one of the best known and foundational phrases that we find in this book. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The book is written to the Hebrews. Who exactly they were, we don't know. It's generally held that they were believers from a Jewish background. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 5 describes himself as a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Some of the subject matter in the book suggests that they have may well have been tempted to return to Jewish rituals or perhaps even to relapse into Judaism again. One of the most common phrases in Hebrews is that of Christ and his work being better than anything else, anything that has gone before. The writer argues that everything is better, a better sanctuary, a better priesthood, a better sacrifice, a better covenant. There's no reason to revert to the old rituals of Judaism because what Christ offers is superior. Now, Hebrews is usually introduced as a letter. And it has some of the features of a letter, particularly the conclusion. But it isn't a letter in the accepted sense. Indeed, the genre of the book is much more that of a sermon. A sermon addressed to a body of men and women who are probably well known to the preacher. The author himself in Hebrew 13.22 refers to his letter as a word of exhortation. The dictionary definition of that word exhortation is to address or, or is an address or a communication emphatically urging people to do something. It's the same phrase used by the Apostle Paul to describe his sermon in the synagogue at Pisidon, Antioch in Acts 13 and 15. So by implication, it's a book that's meant to be heard rather than read. We tend to read scripture, but that was not the case in the early church. Many couldn't read, and the books of the Bible were written to be read publicly, read in the churches to gathered believers. And perhaps because this is written to a Jewish audience, it was to the believers in perhaps Rome or maybe Alexandria, or even Jerusalem. We don't know the author, although there have been plenty of speculation. Paul, Barnabas, Apollos, Luke, Clement are some of the names suggested. But it's almost definitely not the work of Paul because it differs too much in style. Some have even suggested it might be a woman who has written this, perhaps Priscilla. And now that seems an attractive option But it also seems unlikely as the author refers to themselves using the masculine pronoun. And yet despite not knowing the identity of the author, and perhaps that is a good thing, we can tell quite a bit about him from what he says. He's a well-educated person from a Jewish background who's an excellent preacher, probably educated in rhetoric. He has a deep pastoral heart for his people. Obviously knowing their situation and the particular challenges that they face. Further, he has a good knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures and what we know today as the Old Testament. And his use of the Old Testament is of particular interest. He uses it perhaps a little bit like Jesus on the road to Emmaus where he opens the scriptures to Cleopas and his friend. Explaining how it fulfills the coming of Jesus. Sometimes we focus on the New Testament at the expense of the Old. But Hebrews as a book provides a strong link between both and helps us to see their completeness and how they are brought to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. This spring we're planning to run the Bible course. It's a course developed by the Bible Society and it's an eight-week course that helps us to see the big picture of the Bible and how it all fits together. We're still planning this, 
and we're suggesting a provisional starting date for the beginning of February. So at this stage, may I say, just watch this space. More information will follow. I've already alluded to the central place of Christ in the book of Hebrews. Indeed, in chapter 8, the author describes his main point, or the main point of the whole book as being, we have such a high priest, that is Jesus, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens. This high priest is Jesus, the one who not only makes an offering on our behalf to deal with sin, but is the sacrifice through which our forgiveness is possible. In his once and for all sacrifice, we have the opportunity to come into the presence of God, pure and holy, because Jesus is the one who makes that possible for us. And having completed what he came to do, he takes his seat at the right hand of God and he continues to intercede for us. He doesn't need to sacrifice again. He's done that. It's complete. It's finished. It's once for all. But at the Father's side, he mediates on our behalf. And that's why the Christian can have confidence that we can finish the race that we can keep going, that we can persevere, that we can complete the Christian life. It's all because of Christ. Indeed, it's all because of his grace to us. And this is what is picked up in the introductory verses of the book. Indeed, these three verses that Jamie read for us echo that opening passage of John's gospel. Jesus is introduced as the one By whom God has spoken. God, we're told, spoke in the past through prophets. Now he speaks through Jesus. Jesus is God. Sharing in creation. The one who inherits all things. In Jesus we see the Father's glory. Reflecting that line from John 1.14 that we looked at last week. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is is fully human. We looked at that last week. He's also fully God. And two metaphors used in verse 3 emphasize his divinity. Jesus is described as the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his being or his nature. Jesus is what the rays of light are to the sun. Jesus is as the wax imprint on the seal is to the stamp that makes that imprint. They're totally connected, intertwined. And what the writer to the Hebrews wants us to, to, wants to do is to reassure us that what Jesus has done is totally superior to anything else, is totally adequate for our salvation, is totally adequate for our ongoing walk with God. Because Hebrews is not just a book about coming to faith. It is a book about building and encouraging the people of God to walk with God, to mature in their faith. Jesus is is God's answer to the challenges that people face. Jesus is evidence that God cares deeply about us and reaches out to rescue us. His death and resurrection are the catalyst for our salvation. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus continues to sustain his people. He's living and active at God's side on our behalf. That should encourage us. That God is speaking up for, Jesus is speaking up for us at God's sight. So as we conclude, just a few comments about what this means for us. You know, it's so easy to lose focus. And perhaps at the beginning of this new year, what our focus is, is so key. Because it is so easy to look down rather than up. So easy to think that everything is against us. 
So easy to see the problems, a pandemic, obstacles, isolation, and allow those to become the narrative. And I'm not saying that those things are not real. Not at all. I'm certainly not saying that I don't lose focus at times, because I do. But what the writer of Hebrews is wanting you and I to grasp from verse 1 of his book is the need to lift our eyes off ourselves and the problems and the challenges around us and to fix our eyes on Jesus. To focus on who he is and what he's done for us. He's God's son. He's our savior, our redeemer. He's dealt with the mess. He's shouldered our sin, our burdens, and he's given us an inheritance with him. We simply need to receive it and to live into it by faith. You see, Jesus didn't give his life for us to be second-rate Christians. He doesn't want us to lose our way in the race to glory. His desire for each one of us is to live life to the full, to live that life of faith to the full, that life of faith that he has opened up to us. And he wants us to know whose we are, all that he's done for us, and to know that he goes before us every step of the way. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn that focuses on all that Christ has done for us. Oh, to see the dawn.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for seeing us through the uncertainties and challenges of 2020. We enter 2021 with many concerns and challenges still remaining, but with renewed hope. Help us to remember that no matter what lies ahead, no matter what 2021 brings us, you are one step ahead of us. And as you have promised in your word, you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, we thank you for the news this week of the approval of the AstraZeneca vaccine and the impetus this can give to the immunisation campaign for COVID-19. We recognise the challenges associated with the rollout of the vaccine and pray that those tasked with the logistics of this will make decisions that lead to the timely administration of the vaccine to those who need it most. In the meantime, and as the number of positive coronavirus cases increases rapidly after the Christmas period, we ask you to help all of us to recognise responsibilities we have and be patient as we adhere to tighter restrictions in the coming weeks. We recognise, however, that continued isolation is particularly challenging for many, for those dealing with mental health issues, for vulnerable children and in many other family circumstances. You know their needs, Lord, and we pray that you will encourage us to look out for those who need their support both practically and emotionally. Heavenly Father, we pray for the loved ones of those who have passed away in recent times. We ask that you will comfort each one of them with your unfailing love and grace. We pray for your healing for those who are ill, for those who are receiving treatment and for those whose treatment has been delayed. We recognise the feelings of isolation that are experienced by those in hospital as they are denied regular contact with family. May they and their families be aware of your presence with them. We ask that you will remove all fear and anxiety and that they will know the peace that only you can bring. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the continued work of medical professionals and caregivers. We know the considerable resource issues experienced by our health service in this pandemic already and the even greater pressures expected in the coming weeks. We ask that healthcare staff will quickly be vaccinated so that they can be safe and that staffing levels can be maintained. We ask that nurses and doctors will stay clear-minded whilst under pressure and that you will renew their energy and sustain them as they work on long shifts to care for others. Heavenly Father, we are aware that during 2020, many in our community and further afield may have lost their livelihood or income. We know that many are fearful about their jobs and about surviving financially. We pray that 2021 will bring new hope. We pray that you will open new doors for them and that you will inspire your church to generously support them directly or indirectly by their giving. We thank you that an agreement between the UK and the European Union on trade as part of the Brexit deal has been reached and pray that it will ease the way for local companies to continue to trade without penalty or restriction, that jobs can be maintained and created and that greater security will be provided for all. Father, we pray for our church family and thank you for the tireless work of Richard, James and others who bring us our church services in different forms each week. We thank you for all the other work which they do unnoticed in the background to support our church family and ask that you will sustain them in the coming weeks and months. Lord, we pray in particular for the young people of our congregation as our contact with them is limited due to the current restrictions. We pray that they will continue to feel part of this church family, that they will be aware of your love you have for them and they will continue to grow in their faith. Protect them and their teachers as school resumes in the coming weeks. Heavenly Father, in Christ you have made all things new, and so we thank you for this new year. We thank you for your unfailing love and your grace towards us, and so we ask that you guide us into 2021 in faith, not fear, knowing that you are firmly beside us. We ask all these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Karen. And now we're going to conclude with a wonderful hymn Described in our Presbyterian hymn book as being Russian, and I think there's some question about that. Some would uh, suggest a Swedish origin. But it's a song, a hymn that speaks in superlatives about who God is, about what he has done. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder...
May God, our Father, who has called you into his family and made that possible through his Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, enable you by his Holy Spirit to run the race of faith, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. For he has gone before us. He has conquered sin, defeated death, and now intercedes for us at the Father's side. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and continue to be with you through this year and beyond. Amen. See you.